This week we focus on the growing discontent in the continent among the populace and their government or leaders. From the north to the west to central and southern Africa. The Africans are furious and airing their anger. Why is there so much distaste among the people? We will try to answer that burning question shortly. Welcome to Wild of Africa with me, Eric Njoka. The show starts right now. Sudan's ruling military sacked a commander in the southern Blue Nile province after two days of fierce tribal clashes that killed at least 230 people and injured 250 others. The unrest added to the walls of a country mired in civil conflict and political chaos. Fighting in Blue Nile, which borders Ethiopia and South Sudan, reignited early this month over a land dispute, pitting the Hausa tribe, with origins across West Africa, against the Berta tribe. Tens of thousands of protesters gathered at Meskel Square in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, to denounce TPLF, or the Tigray People's Liberation Front, and accuse the Western countries of siding with TPLF by providing armed support. Tigray rebel authorities say they would attend talks aimed at ending the war, as Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed vowed fighting will end and peace will prevail. The government has also said it will participate in negotiations in South Africa being organized by the African Union as diplomatic pressure mounts for a settlement to almost two years of bloodshed. African Union President Marquis Sall says Africa is not against Ukraine, but explained the refusal of many African countries to take sides in the crisis is as a reaction to international indifference to the aggression targeting the continent. And a fashion show called My Scars Are Beautiful is embracing external and internal scars on the body. Organized by two top fashion stores, the show in Kampala celebrated different body shapes and rare conditions and diseases in Uganda. The proceeds from the charity fashion show will go towards an organization that is being set up to support individuals with scars. The contemporary ethical brand plans to continue to celebrate the diversity of beauty. Chad's government clamped down on the country's opposition, suspended seven political parties and searched party offices a day after unprecedented protests around the country left more than 60 people dead. Demonstrators in the capital, Jamena, and several other cities took to the streets to protest against interim leader Mahamat Idris Debi, extending his time in power by two more years. We begin this episode from West Africa. The aftermath. Devastated faces of families in agony, standing outside this makeshift mortuary to identify bodies of their loved ones. And just meters away, the injured sit, staring in oblivion. <laughs> On October 20th, Chad's capital, Jamena, was engulfed in violent protests. When police fired tear gas at protesters, forcing them to flee, what followed was a series of violent clashes across many areas in and around the capital. Reports indicate police may have used live ammunition on the protesters. Burned tires littered the streets of Chagua district, a clear sign of what transpired. When I got up, I opened the door and saw people gathered and got scared. I went home with my children. I'm an orphan woman. They began to ransack the place. They even opened the gate and they went back there. They even threw rocks and threw them in my dealership. And they even burned that locker and threw it in the concession. Imagine it's not war. It's just a demonstration. The country's prime minister announced a curfew and suspended activities of major opposition groups, with the government blames for orchestrating protests that left at least 60 dead and over 300 injured. I announced that the government of the Republic of Chad will ensure that order reigns throughout the territory and that it will not tolerate any excesses wherever they come from. 
the United Nations was first to condemn the legal use of force and demanded an investigation. We call on the authorities to ensure that the security, safety and human rights of all Chadians, including the right of freedom of expression, peaceful assembly and association are respected. We also call on all parties to refrain from violence or excessive use of force and to remain committed to the spirit of dialogue in the interest of peace and stability in the country. Chadians are furious because of this man, Mahamat Idris Debi, who became head of a transitional government when his father Former President Idris Deby Itno died in April 2021 after over 30 years in power. Mahamat initially agreed to an 18-month transition. However, the government recently announced he would stay in power for another two years, prompting the protests. Chad is facing another disaster, floods. Half of the city was underwater. Residents of Jamena were forced to build dikes and use their dugout canoes to leave the flooded areas. The situation forced the president to declare an emergency. This disaster resulting from climate change is one of the most severe the region has seen in years, acting as a multiplier of misery for communities already struggling to keep their heads above water. Chad, our country, has not been spared in this situation, which affects most of the country. Unrests have been ongoing in Chad, which saw little public dissent during the previous regime of Debi's father. Officials claim the late Debi was killed by rebels while visiting his troops on the battlefield. Several demonstrations have taken place since his son became interim leader. Bureau Report, World of Africa. Mtangatanga -tanga Forest Reserve in northern Malawi has been declared a crime scene following the discovery of a mass grave containing decomposed bodies. Investigators are looking into the deaths as a potential migrant smuggling case and have vowed to continue combing the forest for more hidden graves. The following report from Mzimba, Malawi may be distressing. We advise viewer discretion. These could possibly be the remains of Ethiopian migrants who might have left their homes in search of a new life. Authorities in the East African country of Malawi have unearthed a mass grave in Tangatanga Forest Reserve with over a dozen bodies of men between the age of 25 and 40. This is a, a kind of unprecedented event that we have never seen before. So uh, it's something that has shocked everybody in, 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 in Zimba district. After digging at four separate locations in a surrounding area of two kilometers, the authorities have found more bodies, taking the count to around 30. Evidence collected at the scene indicate that the dead were Ethiopian nationals, buried in Matangatanga Forest Reserve, which is located near the main road connecting Malawi and Tanzania in the northern district of Mzimba. An initial probe suggests that these migrants could have possibly suffocated while traveling in a van. Locals in the area have been urged to be on alert while venturing into the reserve. <laughs> We will inform our subjects that our area is under threat such that everyone needs to be more attentive to things. We should all watch our friends back so that we collaborate with government in its efforts. All those that used to go in the forest looking for mushroom and honey among others will be alerted on the dangers in the forest. The shocking incident highlights the plight of migrants and the issue of undocumented immigration in the region. We suspect this uh, uh, illegal immigrant is a big issue, and uh, uh, because this Zimba is almost like a transit point, I think they cross over here to go to the wrong way. Uh, there's more needs to be done right away from the entry point uh, in Nicaragua. Um, uh, we need agencies to work together uh, with the local leaders. Uh, we suspect. Uh, for them to be able to get as far as here, there must be an element of cooperation with local leaders, uh, or, or, or rather the local people. So it's an issue that we, we have to uh, call upon local leaders also to be able to be vigilant uh, in terms of uh, using the local uh, community policing. 
The dream of a new life has turned into a nightmare for hundreds of such Ethiopians, as many of them are held in overcrowded Malawian jails, despite having served their sentences for illegal entry. While recent concern over migrants has focused on Europe, Malawi says there has been a sharp rise in Ethiopians, Somalis and other Africans using the impoverished country as a transit route to seek work in the south. Two years ago, immigration authorities in neighboring Mozambique made a grim discovery, finding 64 migrants from Ethiopia dead inside a freight container loaded on a truck. The International Organization for Migration in Malawi said they were still gathering information about the latest incident. Bureau Report, World of Africa. Drug abuse across Nigeria has become increasingly troubling with many young people, including teenage girls and young women, getting addicted to drugs on a daily basis. Nowadays, many addicts are hooked up to a drug called tramadol, and it's proving difficult for the authorities to curb the prevalence of the menace and trafficking in the country. There have been concerns among community leaders, politicians and groups over the ravaging effects of hard drugs like meth. Here now is a report from Lagos, Nigeria. Drug trafficking and its use are on the rise in Nigeria and are becoming a public health concern. The enforcement agency says that the drug menace is leading to many criminal activities. Nigeria's drug watchdog told Vion that over 19,000 arrests were made in the last 20 months and around 5.4 million kilograms of illegal drugs have been seized across the country. We have 14.3 million Nigerians who abuse um, illicit substances. And um, out of that, I mean, that's which gives you 40.4 um, percent prevalence rate and um, that um, gives us which is three times the global prevalence average of 5.6 almost three times the global prevalence average which is 5.6 and so when you look at that um, it is a big challenge in this in Nigeria the problem of drug abuse there is no need denying that the most common illegal drug used in Nigeria is cannabis, mainly in its herbal form. It is locally produced all over the African region and is therefore affordable. The possession of cannabis is illegal and is punishable by a minimum sentence of 12 years in prison. In serious trafficking cases, life imprisonment may be imposed. There have been calls by experts and some government officials to legalize the cultivation and the use of cannabis they say its health and commercial value is beneficial to the country. However, the drug watchdog disagrees. Cannabis remains a threat to human health because it causes psychosis, leads to uh, some health challenges. There is no need to deny that. People who are promoting cannabis may tell you, yeah, it, um, it um, has this, um, um, it does this, it does that. More often than not, they keep quiet about also the dangers, what cannabis can also do, the harm cannabis can also do to the body, to human health. Despite the stigma and danger of the law, the use of cannabis in Nigeria is growing. Studies show that it ranks just below alcohol as the second most used psychoactive substance in the country. There are an estimated 14.3 million active drug users in Nigeria. The number is likely to hit around 20 million drug users by 2030. This according to an estimate by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes. The rising trend in the demand for and trafficking of narcotic drugs and other illegal substances shows the thriving nature of the market in Nigeria and indeed globally. News of young Nigerians arrested by NDLEA for abusing and attempting to traffic hard drugs plots the tabloids on a daily basis. Ranging from cocaine to cannabis, tobacco and even tramadol and more, the country's drug abuse prevalence stands at 14.4%, a figure slightly higher than the global average. Experts have also um, tried to put the correlation between drug abuse and crime as the rising crime rate in the country uh, seems worrisome. From Lagos, Nigeria, Louisa Olani, we on World is One. 
Now, if you're a fan of rice and there isn't enough in your country, then we suggest you visit Senegal. It's in plenty there. The West African nation's rice production has soared in recent years as it seeks to reduce dependence on imports. Here's a report from Dakar on why a rise in rice production is booming to the country's economy. The Ye Seattle restaurant at the center of Dakar is welcoming guests. Senegalese cook Amy Hue serving one of the favorite rice dishes, the Dien. Amy always tries to use imported rice at a family-run restaurant, knowing that customers prefer the taste of homegrown varieties when they buy her spicy rice-based fish and chicken dishes. For our cooking, we have opted for imported rice. We add a little local rice to it because it adds a little taste and gives us the ideal consistency. The rice from the valley is not of good quality. We would have preferred to cook it because it is homegrown. But imported rice are better and that's what our customers want. If we cook the rice from the valley, some customers may not buy it anymore because of the stones and residues that can be found with it. But with concerns growing over food security across Africa, prompted by trade disruptions caused by the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, dependence on homegrown rice is now in focus particularly after key supplier India curbed rice exports in September. Rice is the staple food in Senegal. We consume a lot of it. Unfortunately, our production from our irrigated and rain-fed production areas do not yet cover our needs. For example, on the rice financing program, a contribution of about 57% is expected from the Senegal River Valley. The Senegal River Valley is expected to contribute 57%, but we are below 40%. One of the great challenges of this area is to be able to produce enough to feed Senegal. Senegal has worked with Japan International Cooperation Agency, supporting rice development and boosting productivity and quality. The Japanese agency has been working to increase means of irrigation. Jika believes this will contribute some 60% of total rice production under the Senegalese Agriculture Acceleration Program. I think there's no difference in the potential for growing rice in Senegal compared with Japan. I think what's different is the attitude of the farmers towards rice growing. But I think that will change. Japanese farmers are emotionally invested in their rice crop. They put a lot of love into it and respect. In Japanese, the character for rice is written as 88. It signifies the painstaking and numerous procedures that go into rice making, from planting to milling. Senegal, which sourced around two-thirds of its rice imports from India last year, urged President Macky Sall to call for talks with New Delhi as India restricted exports due to fears that food shortages could fuel rampant inflation at home. We pray to God that we will never run out of rice completely. We are in a Muslim country with great religious leaders. I don't think we will run out of food. West Africa's dependence on rice imports is a drain on foreign reserves, costing it around $3.7 billion in 2021, according to UN Trade and Development Agency's data. Bureau Report, World of Africa. Some of South Africa's biggest cities have been experiencing water shortages for the past couple of weeks. This has erupted fears of day zero. While government says it's not a crisis, experts view it otherwise. Here's a report from our correspondent, Calden Ongmu. The famous saying, water, water everywhere but not a drop to drink, is turning out to be true for South Africa's economic hub, Gauteng province, which is experiencing major water shortages. While the dams are full, the cities are out of water. The problem lies with the decaying infrastructure that has forced authorities to implement water shedding in parts of the province. Experts blame that poor planning and management has led to this crisis. 
In short, the, the crisis that we're actually experiencing now is due to dilapidated and aging infrastructure, which has not been maintained. Yes, the consumers use uh, above average consumption. However, we have to note that even though it's stated that we're using 300 liters per person per day, we're also including the, the physical losses as well as the leakages and bursting pipes. So it's a combination of factors, but at the end of the day, it is due to poor planning as well as management. In the year 2017-2018, the day zero clock was ticking for Cape Town due to a severe drought, inadequate supply management and government failure. In the year 2017-2018, the day zero clock was ticking for Cape Town due to a severe drought, inadequate supply management and government failure. Once again, the same nervousness and panic can be felt around Johannesburg and Tswane region. Look, we have to remember that South Africa is a semi-arid um, climate country. We are a water scarce country. So yes, we will be sitting with water shortages. There are numerous areas across the country which is sitting with water shortages, especially within your rural areas like Limpopo, Northern Cape, Northwest. There are so many examples. So to say that we will be faced with water shortages, yes. In some areas, there's already a water deficit. Trucks like these have been delivering water to residents, or businesses and hospitals for the past three weeks in some of the areas of Gauteng province. Experts have warned if government does not wake up and improve things, this crisis will soon spill over to other provinces. This is Kelvin Ongma from Johannesburg, South Africa. For We On, World is One. In Marrakesh, the food market on Gemma El Fina Square is buzzing again as vendors serve around 10,000 meals a day. Street food vendors cook traditional Moroccan dishes for tourists who are back after a COVID hiatus. Take a look at this next report. The square known for its street food stalls is buzzing with activity. The Gemma El Fina Square has more than 60 stalls where vendors cook sheep heads, brains and beef in big pots, serving 10,000 meals every day. In the morning we go to the slaughterhouse, we buy all we need, then the slaughterhouse delivers what we bought to our shop where we cook all the meals, especially tangier. Once cooked, we put it in tangier ceramic pots to keep it warm. Our cooking secret is that we cook it very well keep it clean, but also we don't forget the spices. One of the best sellers is tangia, a dish named after terracotta pot in which it's cooked. It's usually made of beef, candied lemon, garlic, saffron, cumin and olive oil. It's then placed in the pot and cooked very slowly in the ashes of a wood oven. Customers can then enjoy the famous dish accompanied by homemade bread, olives and vegetables. Tangia is the speciality of Marrakech. Meat is the main ingredient, which comes with other ingredients. There are also cow and sheep's heads. So this square is known for its various kinds of food, and especially the popular ones. But what makes this area in Marrakech so popular and world famous? Here, I know it's very popular, the tagine. Um, that's what it's famous for. We've had tagine a couple of times and enjoyed it. I love street food any, uh, from any country. It's just a part of the culture. You know, it's a new taste. Uh, and th th it's always vibrant wherever you're buying it, you know. There's plenty of drinking options too. One of them is this popular fruit juice stall. However, the other attraction that has gripped the eyes of many locals and foreigners here is a small sluggish animal in a shell, which is considered a snack. We were walking around in Marrakesh and I wanted to eat snails. It's always nice to eat snails. At night, the stalls light up and even get busier to serve dinner. Morocco welcomed 3.2 million tourists in June and July 2022, the same number as in 2019. Jama Alfina has been on UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity since 2001. Here a report, we are World is One. The Africa Eco Race 2022 kicked off despite dangers and threats from rebel groups in Western Sahara. 
The race from Monaco to Senegal invokes the spirit of the Dakar Rally, which moved from Africa in 2009 due to security concerns in Mauritania. Here are the highlights of the race's 14th edition. And that's our time on this week's episode. Check out our social media platforms to watch the show and give your feedback. Thanks for watching Wild of Africa. I'm Eric Njoka and this is We On Wild Is One.